I guess it started starts way back when, like all stories do, uh, once upon a time. I don't, I don't know what year that was. I, it must have been, what, 31? 31. Yeah. In those days, they, they were simple. If anything you could get in the air, you could enter in a race. You could look at them and uh, get some idea of how they were going to fly. You wouldn't win, maybe, but you'd at least enter. You learned a lot from that. This is something new. Those, those people were pioneers. A lot of them put their lives on the line, and they were all good pilots, and all competing against one another. Airplanes are dumb. They are the personification of perversity. Uh, they will always do that which you do not want them to do. Uh, they are never your friend. And that was the reason uh, that uh, we do a lot of this. We want to triumph over that beast that is out there to kill us. I think flying's a challenge to, to be able to do it and to do it well. Speed's always been a challenge. Racing is, is inherent in the nature of man. It's fun to win. We're competitive beasts. A hell of a lot better than second. Well, those were the days when aviation was proving itself. Well, it was a long race, long, tedious race where the pilot and the whole schmear had to be in top order and the pilot had to know how to get there and not get lost. And those that didn't know how to do it didn't make it. And it was a test of both man and machine, pure and simple. A Bendix racer did something that nobody else was doing, nobody else had ever done. And that was getting from point A to point B in less time than man had ever moved in doing it. And that was adventuresome. The Bendix Trophy Race was the greatest human and machine endurance race of its time. The ultimate all-American aviation event. From sea to shining sea, the world's fastest men and women pursued this beautiful symbol of excellence in the air. As they flew against the limits of technology, courage, and skill, the Bendix racers captured the imagination of an admiring public. Well, it was thrilling. It was exciting. I mean, it was like Barnum and Bailey a hundred times over. People came from all over, and there was something like 250,000 people. Did you ever see pictures of the stands at Cleveland? Unbelievable. They were huge. People were everywhere, in trees. That, that place was jammed. Little communities would set up their own little grandstands and have a picnic. I had never in my life seen that many automobiles in one place, and they were all meticulously parked because Cliff Henderson was one hell of an organizer. My husband, Cliff Henderson, uh, really thought of the Bendix as his baby. Cliff understood why those people came to the races. There wasn't much else in the Depression to look at but airplanes, really. It was Lindbergh and Doolittle and uh, anybody that flew those fast airplanes. Those are the heroes. They were absolute heroes. They were American uh, public heroes. They were American heroes. They came from every part and sector of America, from the cities and from the towns from the honored halls of academia and from the dirt floor garages deep in the heartlands. They represented the hopes, dreams, and adventures of millions of earthbound, depression-ridden Americans. They were explorers, discovering a new frontier high above the mundane problems of a troubled era. In the memories we have of the 1930s, the image of the Bendix racer is that of a shining star pointing future generations toward greatness. This is Jimmy Doolittle. I flew in the Bendix race. I'm not sure it was the first one, but whichever one it was, I won it. The greatest, the only one. I think he's the, he's the best. Jimmy was one of those extreme drive type human beings of go, 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 push, 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 the ultimate, always the ultimate, never settle for second. There is no such thing as second to a man like uh, Jimmy Doolittle. I am a single-minded individual. I have the capability to think clearly, concisely, constructively about one thing at a time and one thing only. And that thing is surviving. And so you, uh, you do those things that are necessary to survive. And you do them instinctively and you do them promptly. Ah, there's my hero. Um, that's Jim 
as he landed after winning the Bendix at Cleveland. Everybody thinks it was Errol Flynn. I always thought of Jimmy Hazelip as being the perfect gentleman. He always looked so dashing. Oh, I nearly swooned. And he was a very fine pilot. We're in the money, we're in the money. And that's Roscoe, bless his heart, Turner. He was the personification of showmanship in his blue uniforms and his wings that he designed himself and his uh, 50 Mission Crush hat, uh, his uh, carefully waxed mustache, his lion cub, Gilmore, that flew with him. And he come out in his uniform. You know, I said, boy, that's the way to go. <laughs> this has got to be the epitome of, uh, of flying. Rossi said, I don't like to wear this fancy uniform, but this is part of my thing, and uh, it does a lot for aviation, and it did. It put class in it. Everybody loved him. I'm Glenda Mae Davis. I was married to Doug Davis, the pilot, who won the Bendix Trophy in 1934. Doug was preaching, if anyone ever did, that flying was another safe means of transportation. He dressed like you would going to the office. A, a business suit, shirt, and tie. I never saw him without that tie. Of course, when Doug Davis was killed, why, uh, we felt very bad about that because we liked him a great deal. He was a splendid pilot and a, a, a real wonderful person. I really think it's to my credit that I never once asked him not to fly. But I did get off back of the hangar and pray about it. Anyone that says they're not afraid to fly, there's something wrong with them. They're, most of them are dead or they're going to be dead because you always got to have that fear there to, to keep you honest and to make you do what you know you ought to do. I've known a lot of fearless flyers and a lot of them aren't around today. If the wings came off, as they did occasionally, uh, there's no time to be frightened, there's no time to be thrilled, there's no time to do anything except the things that you have to do damn fast to survive. Benny Howard, the man who uh, designed uh, Pete, Ike, Mike, and Mr. Mulligan, of course, that won uh, the 1935 Bendix race. Benny had this tremendous uh, desire and these ideas in his head about an airplane and could put those thoughts and concepts down on paper and then he would build an airplane from them. That airplane uh, is the physical embodiment uh, of that man's desire to do the ultimate. Everybody loves a baby, that's why I'm in love with you, pretty baby. My mother was very fortunate to have been a Bendix winner in 1936, and probably even more fortunate that she happened to be in it the first time that uh, women and men were competing at the same time. and. Uh, she wound up not only getting the consolation prize that Mr. Bendix had offered for any poor woman who could even finish the race, uh, but she got the top prize, too. My mother felt, I think, back in the 20s and the 30s, as did most of the rest of the women pilots, that uh, they were going to have an uphill fight to be able to participate in the aviation world at that time, because it, it was definitely a man's world. It took many a year for them to finally convince uh, the powers that be that to at least let them compete. There were some very good women pilots. As, as a matter of fact, I think almost all of the women pilots were good. Uh, because if they weren't good in those days, I don't think they would have survived. I'm Frank W. Fuller, Jr. And I'm proud to say that I was fortunate enough to win the 1937 and 1939 Bednick's Transcontinental Races. In 1938, I suffered the humiliation of being beaten by a woman, quite a famous woman, however, 
Jacqueline Cochran. Uh, she out-navigated uh, Frank Fuller, uh, a point which he still is sore about today. <laughs> this is not in the way of an alibi, but the weather was very bad that year. Jackie Cochran, certainly. She was quite a woman, I'll tell you. She was probably the number one woman pilot in this United States. Now, she was a wealthy woman, and therefore she had the leg up on a heck of a lot of the other gals. Well, that's no crime. But she had a lot of intestinal fortitude. I suppose the thing that we all had was a love of flying and a desire to excel. It was something that I thought was very, very beautiful. Their delight in being together, you know, and talking about the things that they were most interested in. It was something unusual, I thought, very fine, very special. It was a very close-knit group. Actually, between the men and the women both, uh, they all really knew each other. And then they'd get together and they'd talk at the same time. I don't know who was saying what, but they seemed to know. And then in a short time, by no choice of anybody's, they were at war. The Bendix Trophy races, like many other aspects of American life, disappeared for a while. And when they returned at war's end, the rules of the game had changed considerably. First time I ever saw a jet airplane, it was over southern Germany, and he was shooting at me. Oh, the first jet I ever saw, I, I guess, uh, I just wondered what made it go. You know, I walked around to the front, and then I walked around to the back, and, uh, you know, there, was, there wasn't any propeller there, and, uh, and I kind of felt that, uh, you know, something's missing. <laughs> you know, what do you hang on to? And, of course, then you look at the aircraft, you stand off and look at it, and it's so slick, it's so clean. You know, you know that it's going to be able to fly. There's just no question in your mind that this airplane is going to go fly. Between 1946 and 49, the Bendix featured two race divisions, one for the propeller-driven warbirds of recent glory, and another for the new jets hot off America's drawing boards. If you plan to motor west, Eventually, the privately owned planes gave way completely to the high-tech, high-speed military aircraft. The jet age was here, and the Bendix was to be its proving ground. For more than a decade, the Bendix Trophy races continued to provide a platform for advancements in aviation technology, advancements that seemed to take place at a dizzying pace, with all records being shattered almost yearly by bold young pilots and sleek new machines. By the final Bendix race in 1962, Man had proven that he could race the sun across America and win. First, the big stories from CBS. Official now, new speed record for that B-58 bomber. Los Angeles to New York to Los Angeles. Four hours, 16 minutes, 22 seconds. That's 47 minutes faster than anybody has ever done it. An Air Force B-58 bomber has set startling new speed records and won the Bendix Trophy for high-speed flying. The leg eastward from Los Angeles to New York took only two hours, one minute, and 39 seconds. And I'll have more news after this message from our window breaker, Louise King. We as a people look to the future more than we do our history. Uh, we're a young nation. The history of aviation is represented by the Mendix Trophy race. I think it uh, undoubtedly advanced the state of the art in aircraft design, airfoil design, to get more efficient airfoils, and developing range of airplanes to enhance their, their radius of action. 
improve speed, improve performance. It made everybody realize that uh, you didn't have to take uh, three and a half days on a train to go across the country. Well, it's uh, today the fastest, the most comfortable, the safest way to travel. And in those days, we were helping to make it that. And to, to be a part of that beginning was uh, a real kick. As time went on, you know, I said, there he is, Johnny Dulo. I mean, he's, he's the idol of so many people. And there I am, you know, right next to him on the same trophy. Well, aviation was my life for quite a while. And uh, I feel that I've gotten back much more, much more than I gave. I sat there warming the engine, and a phrase came back to me from a book that I had just read. Let's see if I can recall it. From whence I started, how have I ever come to this? I tell you the way I feel. Lee. If you live in the past and you dread the future, you've destroyed the present. This is all we have right now. The airplane and I were young together a long time ago when flying and flight were synonymous. We tightened the seat belt in the open cockpit and in the doing buckled on the wings of flight unshackled, unfettered, free to soar as never bird had soared. Flight is abiding peace, absolute serenity, purest joy. It's a spirit totally free. Flight is yesterday's yearning, the fulfillment of today's dreams, tomorrow's promises.